Stephen Brian Pinnell, known as Delaware's only serial killer, also known as the Corridor, Ki Corridor Killer and the Route 40 Killer, also known as the Route 13 Killer, was uh, put to death by the state of Delaware in 1992 by lethal injection. Uh, did the police said uh, at the time that he had multiple other victims, but they did not you know ultimately source those he was he was not forthcoming when he was arrested even though he definitely uh, facilitated the process of his own execution in fact he spoke before the state supreme court and urged them to put him, him put him to death um, even though he did that he still was not revealing where a missing body was uh, that they were looking for one of his known victims I think there is a reason for that I believe is that he did not want them to find other victims in that same vicinity wherever that woman had been her body had been placed and I think one of those other victims I wanted to make the case for is uh, Sherry M. Magaro who was is missing from the date of February 22nd 1987 she disappeared in a snowstorm she was driving home from Kennedyville Maryland to Harrisburg Pennsylvania and she left uh, right in the beginning of a snowstorm that would ultimately deposit 18 inches on the ground. Uh, it wasn't a snowstorm, though, that did her, and it was a maniac. What happened is she had pulled over by the side of the highway. People speculate whether she was helping someone, whether she was uh, herself experiencing vehicle problems. The vehicle was later checked and said to be okay, but, you know, anything could have gone wrong. A light could, a warning light could have scared her. Visibility could have been poor. Anything. She could have gotten stuck. We don't know. But the point is that people saw her talking to a man a stranger you know that unidentified man standing beside her vehicle uh, when she was stopped that night she left around 9 30 9 45 p.m. to try to beat the storm home she had a two and a half hour drive she only made it about 20 minutes outside of where she left from and that's where her vehicle was found out in a field 100 feet off the the highway uh, set it had been burned but it hadn't burned completely it had only burned a bit and then the fire had gone out so they found evidence inside including her blood and they found enough brain matter sorry for that gore but they found enough of that to state that she had to be deceased at that point they searched for her body in the immediate area you know quite diligently uh, and up up the road quite a bit her credit cards were used the next day somebody attempted to make a purchase at a Sears in um, Harford Mall which isn't that far from there also in Maryland and uh, the credit card was declined for insufficiency of funds um, at the time, there was no video taken of that individual, and we don't know if that's, you know, the individual who committed the act or if it's a, a person who found the credit card. It seems unlikely, though, it's a person who just happened to find the credit card because the credit card was being used the very next morning while the police were investigating this crime scene, and, uh, you know, there was 18 inches of snow on the ground. Not too many people are going to be walking down the highway, that stretch of highway, at that, you would assume, at that, you know, after an 18-inch snowstorm. Uh, they're worried about digging their cars out and such. So, it kind of implies that it probably was the same individual there were two sketches given one of the person who was by the side of the road that somebody had seen a uh, drive by a person driving by and which you know is not going to be a very good description probably at 9 30 at night on in a snowstorm and the other one which we would assume would be a little better would have been by uh, the store clerk who encountered the individual trying to buy a large screen tv with sherry mcgarrow's credit card but the reason why and you can investigate this further if you want look it up online about uh stephen Brian Pinnell, but it fits his M.O. It was a little before his first known victim, but only 10 months before his first known victim, which was November 1987. This is the same year. It's February uh, 1987. And as I said, they suspected he had other victims. And the reason why I believe the only other alternative, you know, either you believe that, you know, the person that she left from the home, uh, her boyfriend where she was staying with down in Maryland, or you know her ex-husband was considered a suspect by some up in Pennsylvania none of those people seemed to be in the area the husband took lie detector tests the police ultimately said they found nothing on him the boyfriend had never even really been suspected and if you look at the facts of the case with her leaving calling her mother saying that she's leaving because she wants to get to work the next morning there's no sign that there was any thing uh, any kind of conflict that would indicate you know there would be a, a, a violent uh, murder but the the other alternative the most likely one that most people would f lean towards would be that a random stranger you know rolled her you know found her by the side of the roll wanted her her money wanted her credit cards and that this person uh you know attacked her but 
the violence of the attack is one thing, it's, which is, you know, total overkill from what we've seen. The police won't say what was used to inflict the blunt trauma, but I'm wondering whether it was a hammer because Stephen Pinnell was known to kill his victims with a hammer. He, he did put ligatures around these, women neck, these women's necks, but he also used a hammer. Um, and uh, so I'm wondering, since the police wouldn't say, if that's exactly what they thought it was. Even still, the thing that, that troubles me the most is the fact that you know, her body was never recovered, and they did very diligent search. One of his other victims' bodies was never recovered. And uh, who would take, here, if you're thinking about it, you know, if you think about it logically, if this is somebody, you know, robbing a woman by the side of the road opportunistically, they pull over, they happen to see her, and I don't think, they didn't mention a rape. They never said whether there was a rape. Seems that there wasn't because they didn't mention anything. And again, he did not rape his women. He tortured his women, but he did not rape them. Uh, and I apologize for saying his women. Apologizing his victims. Uh, you know, even putting that pronoun in front of him, it's disgusting. Um, but the, the thing is, with regard to him, is that why would they remove the body? You know, the person. It's, it's they're going to contaminate their vehicle. They're, they're going to be covered in blood. They're going to, you know increase the likelihood they're going to get caught. But this is somebody whose prime motive was to abduct these women, get them in an isolated location, and torture them. So it would make sense in the context of Stephen Pinnell that this is exactly what he would do after he had subdued a woman, that he would take her and put her in his vehicle and take off. Um, the other thing, you know, this is, and if you look at the distance from where his main victim hunting ground was, it is, I looked it up on Google, it's like 20 miles. It's like, I think it was 23 miles. Uh, it may even be closer to some of the victims. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, it's nothing in terms of distance. And it fits his MO in some regards because one, if you looked at the time that his victims were abducted, abducted, a lot of these people that you know, hunt women like this, they're doing it in the wee hours of the night and stuff. His victims, they were all like between 6 p.m. And, and, you know, 10 p.m. And she had left at 9.30, 9.45 and, you know, been there. So she was right in that time zone when he apparently was, you know, stalking individuals. So that's another thing that, that drew my attention to him. You know, you have proximity, you have MO, you know, modus operandi, you, you have the time frame that he normally, you know, works in. And uh, the thing that, again, drew my attention, when I looked at the Sketches. You can. I'll include them here in the video. That I apologize for the poor resolution, but it was a, a small uh, inset photo I found online. Both of the photos, and the police speculated that these two individuals, although there were superficial differences, like a mustache, you'll see that the police speculated they actually were the same individual by the side of the road and the individual trying to fence the TV. And I kind of believe it because if you look at the main features, the, you know, the hair particularly, that slope of the hair at that, what, 45 degree angle across the forehead, both people cited that, which is to me an unusual type of, uh, you know, w way to wear your hair for men. Um, and... Uh, he also, I mean, one had it one going one way, one had it like a mirror image, but you might remember it reversed in terms of how it went across the forehead, but you're going to remember how it went. And if you look at the mugshot, which I'll also include the video, which would have been the most closest to time here, it was the same year when he was uh, apprehended, and the photo, he's wearing his hair in exactly the fashion that you see uh, in both of those police sketches. So again, and it resembles him. It superficially resembles him very strongly, I think. I don't think there's any reason it could be ruled out, because when you see the killers when they're apprehended, and you look at the sketches, he's about, it's about par. It matches up, you know, in terms of how much he matches. So I really do think that Sherry McGar, I hate to say it, was one of his early victims, because it's a very horrible fate. But the good news, I mean, horrible say good news, but the, the only saving grace is that she was considered incapacitated. She had to have been unconscious, if not already dead, at the time he took the body. So uh, he would not have been able to torture her the way he did to some of these victims who ultimately didn't die of the torture, but ultimately died when, when he used the hammer on them. Uh, blunt force trauma, which is, you know, how the attack, the blitz attack went on Sherry Magaro. I just do not see, uh, this is not a typical type situation where somebody robs you and then they're going to try to burn the vehicle to allegedly hide evidence. Evidence and but yet they're going to take your body at the same time. You know why would you take a dying or dead body uh, in in your vehicle unless you're a psychotic individual, uh, someone like him? So I, I do think that if you look at all the facts of the case, that it's very probable that this could potentially be even his first victim because it was so disordered and, and chaotic in terms of how he tried to quote unquote dispose of evidence, which was really pathetic, and uh, also because of you know again proximity M O. The, the police sketch, all those things combined to make it very likely that you, this is uh, an early victim, if not the first victim, of serial killer Stephen 
Brian Pinnell. Justice has already been served in that case, and I applaud the state of Delaware for pursuing that through to you know what the end that it should have come to with the execution. I don't know if it would have actually gone that easy if he hadn't been complicit in his own execution, but uh, allegedly that was because he did not want to disgrace his family any further. This man had a wife, he had children, decent people that had no idea they were living with a monster. Um, you know, God only knows, you can only imagine how horrible that must be when you discover something like that. And uh, he wouldn't want them to know anymore. From what we see, he didn't want to reveal any more information. He he referred to himself in the in the third person as he was uh, arguing for his own execution, like it was a separate persona that had killed these people. And uh, so that would make sense that he wouldn't want to explain where that woman's body was if there were other bodies there at the same location where he was, you know, using as a quote unquote dumping ground. And uh, one of those bodies might also have been the uh, the never discovered Sherry Magaro. So. Here's to hoping that eventually these women are found and laid to rest properly so their families can have some small more measure of peace. Uh, and uh, we'd be interested in hearing any of your comments or and we'll interact with anybody who wants to respond.